Well, everybody, today is the 13th of June, the last time we'll see 70 degrees in Dallas, since it'll be something closer to a blast furnace <laughs> by the time we hit this weekend in the triple digits. This is Dallas Personal Robotics Group. Uh, we'll just go around the table and talk robot things and uh, either sharing projects or uh, asking questions. And we have two in queue and then open mic. So first we have uh, Doug D, then we have Ray. And then uh, wherever the conversation leads us, Doug, how's it going? Oh, working on the steampunk robot. Uh, I've been busy working in the yard mostly, but I did get these legs finally on here. I don't know if that's a good view or not, but you can see it's got these hub things here. That was a real trick to get those things straight so that would go through on that that post but on the plus did i leave this out what's that sorry thought i was muted watch this oh i calibrated yet oh. but they do what they're supposed to do i still have to put the uh the interrupts in with the all the tick counts and everything, so they go the correct amount. You may have noticed they overshot. They're supposed to go 90 degrees, 90 degrees. But making progress, I was able to actually get the legs on. They look real stubby, but that's because the the uh, the motors stick out quite a bit, and then the tires stick out quite a bit, and there's not a lot of room there. So they'll lift the robot up about six inches off the pavement. Well, you should have told us they were supposed to go more than 90 degrees for technical reasons. <laughs> well, I was actually thinking maybe 100 degrees. Just yeah. Like, like, you know. Yeah, so they didn't know. Design but margin. Whoa. The, the big problem is that it it's using the same amount. I'm using just time right now to run the motor for so yeah. many microseconds. It runs out for like 680 microseconds, comes back for 580 microseconds, and it still goes too far. So <laughs> it definitely needs interrupts. <laughs> yep, definitely. I haven't tweaked it because I figure why bother I, when I get the interrupts. I'm just going to go off of tick counts. Hey, yeah. Doug, yeah? I, I was wondering if you'd like to think about it. I know you're into this pretty deep, but I, I, another alternative way of doing it. Give me a second here. I'm trying to get... Where you can see me. Okay. Uh, we did this with the Robbie robot. Okay. So instead of trying to screw around with all your encoders and everything, uh, just take a simple optical interrupt and a disk. And so in that yeah. way, it rolls 90 and you can tune it. Uh, yourself, you know, by just putting a different, you, you want to make it so that you can put the disc in fairly easily without right. taking the whole robot apart. But other than that, that, that it's very, very stable. It's, you never have to worry about anything, you know, it, it just, when the light goes through the hole in there. <laughs> it's right. Yeah. And uh, that way, so, you, and then your motor, all it has to do is be on or off. For that motor, I don't know. Are you using another motor too? Is that motor double purposed? No, that motor is strictly for raising and lowering the legs. Okay. I have another motor that's for the running the wheels. Okay, so that that one, yeah, that one there. I would I would definitely seriously think about using a disc and an optical encoder. You could use a micro switch too, by the way. That's actually what I was thinking. I might do. Is yeah. Just a, what I was calling a limit switch when it when it hits it stop. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I I I personally like the optical encoder, but you know this there's a gazillion ways to solve this cat. Yeah, yeah the, the advantage there is just counting steps. You don't know where you started, but this way you have absolute positioning. Yeah. yeah. One one minor problem I had is that the back legs just do the ninety degrees down and back. But mm -hmm. the front legs have to go down and may go around the other side. So that it's a single right motor controls both, right? And leaning forward type thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So 
that makes it trickier to do the switching thing because it could be in multiple places. But it could be a switch that it, it just kind of goes past and bumps and can keep going if I want it to. Yeah. That could be programmed. Yeah. But anyway, that's something that's to think like about. One way to skin a dog. Yeah. Yeah. Whoa. I don't know what I'm doing here. There I am. <laughs> so, next. <laughs> All right. Well, that's cool. Uh, love it. So then, uh, and I put a black star down if I remember the scheme right. Okay, cool, cool. Awesome. So that means uh, Mr. Ray, more computer, okay. distance computer thing? So, oh, yeah. Um, I was um, playing around with the OpenMV H7 and the MaxSense A010 and um, the MaxSense has a, a serial port on it that you can work at higher bit rates, like, um, what is it, 900 and one, let's see, 91, 91, 26, 0, 0, so almost, um, almost a um, megahertz for the baud rate. Um, <clears throat> and that's what I was working that on. So... I was trying to get the image of the of the distance map from the distance sensor into you know the memory of um, the OpenMVH7, um, so I could you know basically do manipulation on it. Um, you can transfer over um, a color image. It'd be um, I think it's the R RGB 565, so it's 16 bits, or you can do grayscale, which is just 8 bits. And um, I chose to do uh, 8 bits. Um, I don't know if it'll come up. I can try it here. I've got to get um, the OpenMV uh, IDE up and running. Let me try that and see what I can do. Hold on. For some reason, the it doesn't always come up right, but had the image on there. Come on, come on. Nope. Okay, not going to cooperate. <sighs> yeah, it's it's demo shy. I guess it's not going to cooperate. Um. For some reason, it doesn't always come up right. I haven't been able to figure that out yet, but I was actually able to get the image um, from the MaxSense A010 over onto it in black and white. It's pretty small. It's only 25 pixels by 25 pixels, but um, that's enough to, you know, do some some guidance with i was actually just going to look at one line of 25 pixels and see what um see what depths those you know that was at but um let me play around with it some more and uh, maybe later on i'll have another demo okay
Anyway, what is what is the max stint? Um, it's a it's a one hundred by one hundred um, distance measurement sensor. Um, that's the maximum number of pixels it'll do, or or distance measurements. You know, one hundred measurements by one hundred measurements. Um, it's good for, I think, two and a half meters at the at the most. Um, let me see if I can get that up and show you. I've got to go. I just thought you were working on video. Oh yeah. Um, was it's to try to get the image over so I can process it on uh, the Open VH7. But are, are you using it for uh, visual light, or are you using it for the depth image? Uh, for the depth image, um, so the to be able to you know you can't do any manipulation on the MaxSense A zero one zero. You've you've got to transfer that to another processor basically to look at that that data and try to figure out you know what it's trying to tell you what's in front of you and what the instructions are uh hold on a second i'll go to the com tool i think i've showed you this before but let's see Com tool. Okay. Go. Uh, hmm. I'm seven. Open. You art. There it is. Okay. I'm going to present now. Okay. Where's that? No, something didn't work right. All right, hold on. Hmm. Tool chain. There we go. Okay, for some reason it didn't sh give me an image. Okay. Let's see if it's going to fly. Okay, there we go. If we, have a, if we have a robot that flies, what color of star is that? Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, this is the image from, that's my hand waving out in front of it. I don't know if you can see that or not. Yeah. Um, so that's actually giving me distance measurements. Like uh, right now the center is, that's about 26 centimeters away. Um, and that's that's 100 by 100. Um, you know, I can. Uh, is that not in the top left corner of the lamp back there? What is that? It is. Yeah. If I turn it off. Oops, that's not going to matter. OK, if I raise it about. There you go. Yeah, it's a little like a gooseneck lamp. OK. Um, I just raised it out of the field of view. It was like oh. right over here. Um, anyway, this is a, this is a wire. Um, <laughs> this is the desktop right here. It's got wires and a meter. And this is actually the edge of a fluke meter right here. Um, anyway, so what I was trying to do was to get, um, this image. Yeah, it looks like it really has depth to it. I mean, give a sense of depth. Looking at the end, just looking at the end. Good. Yeah, it's a, it's just a colorized right. image. You know, the the closer it is, the you know, the redder it is. So you know, it goes yellow and green, and there's a little bit of blue, like right there, all the way back. Like if I move that around a little. 
and that's just showing the there's a little little bit of wall back there. Um, anyway, so what this was I keep going for my mouse here, but it's disconnected. Hold on a second. And I'm gonna get the baud rate up. Okay, I did that. Okay, so I'm gonna disable that. I'm gonna go to the other screen. Oops, but not without a mouse. And I'm gonna stop this. Yeah, you can see what it is now. Yeah. Oh, um, can you see this? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So there's the the edge of the fluke meter and kind of background stuff and the wire. Um, let's see if I can get this to run. Okay. Thing. Let's see if I disconnect this. Yep, demo mode. It's not going to do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's. I have to kind of play around with it to get it to work. So it's it's kind of marginal at this point. But basically, took a program that they you know they said would run on. Um, The, uh, oops. You know, one of their other processors, the uh, Max Doc, D O C K, and um, uh, so you could, you could colorize it if you wanted to, but um, yeah, for some reason it's not working. I don't know why. Come on, show me an image. Yeah, nope, not gonna work. Andy, what it was supposed to do was supposed to show this image in black and white or grayscale on the uh, OpenMVH7. And uh, just be, let me see here. The other thing was the actual video image. Not a depth image. Um, say that again. The other image on, on OpenMV was a video image in black and white, not a depth image. Um, on the yeah, on, on the um, the OpenMV H7, that on this um, IDE. This is just yeah. a black and white image. It's not a depth image. Okay. Right. And I was going to, you know, when it works, it superimposes up here. It's like 25 by 25 okay. pixels, so it's pretty small. Um, this one, I think, is quarter, quarter VGA. So, um, and it's VGA two, so it's actually set up to be 128 by 160 pixels for this image. So um, 25 by 25 of the, uh, I think maybe that's what I was doing wrong here. Hold on a second. Yeah, I had this here. And if I switch it down, it goes to And I'm not. Let's see. Now it's not making. Oh, that's why. Uh, USB. Open. It says I'm connected. Okay. Yep. Okay, now it's not showing up on the screen. Here we go. 
Okay, so this is no, still at unit one. Okay. Let's see if it's at four by four. Yeah, just not cooperating today. I can't seem to change that. Hold on, let me get rid of this. Here we go. Okay, there's 25 by 25. So it's much coarser, but, you know, I can still get depth out of it. And 25 pixels across should have been good enough. Okay, now if I go back to this, let's see if... It's still not showing me the image. Uh, anyway, I gotta play around with it, figure out what I'm not doing right here. Come on, show me the image. <laughs> show me the money. Anyway, had it working. Not certain why it's not working at this point, but. Uh... Okay, so Ray, once you did get it in there. Yeah. Could you um, do anything with it? Um, no, it's just um, transferring it over to getting it into the OpenMV, um, you know, into the memory as, as an image. And but this, in this case, is just grayscale. Mm -hmm. There's no color associated with it. So here, my my image is actually 25 by 25. It's grayscale. Um, he did have a lookup table, the jet colors. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's the RG, you know, red, green, blue, uh, blue colorization from the grayscale. So he's got, um, I don't know how many different numbers here. It's goes on and on. It's pretty long. I think it's okay. 256 for the, you know, all the grayscale numbers. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, I'm not certain. Let me see if I can get it to fly again here. Yes, One sir. more time. Is this an unplug, plug it back? Um, not this guy. He's working. Yeah. What about the other guy? Um, it's it flashes up the the image, the black and white image. Um for the camera, but it doesn't superimpose the other one on it. Oh, oh so that was the other thing. I had this at 10 frames per second. Okay. You aren't. Okay. I'm going to turn off USB so it should freeze and then go to the other one. And it's still not working. Go oh, well. So much for demos. Yeah. So, okay. So let's say you did, you were successful, Ray, and you got the 25, up in the upper right-hand corner, you got your 25 by 25. And you said yeah. it would be another black, it'd be just black, uh, it'd be grayscale. Yeah. Okay. And so then the table that was you showed us translates that grayscale into a depth. Yeah. It's okay. It's okay. basically the the distance in centimeters of each of okay. those pixels in the twenty by twenty five by twenty five array. Okay. So is, yeah. So can you, do, can you now do can you now do an area of interest in that twenty in that twenty five by twenty five area and and do something with it yeah you can do like um get pixel and you know set pixel and you know basically interrogate individual pixels for their depth and so the first thing i was going to try was just to look at a line of the yeah. 
of yeah, the pixels just to see if I could, you know, do something with that. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's relatively slow. I know. Um, let me see if I can present again. I know the get pixel and put pixel is like. They don't seem to recommend that. That's like one of the slowest operations that. Um, OpenCV. Yeah, that you can do in OpenCV. Mm -hmm. And um, whoop, that's what it uses, though, um, to create the image. And I don't know that there's any other way to do it. Um, yeah, right here is using set pixel. So he. You know, basically, it synchronizes with the with the data stream, and it looks for. Where is it? Frame. True, your data. The data. Okay. It basically looks. There's a a head and a tail. Here's the frame head. Mm -hmm. uh, zero zero FF and they actually had the tail initially as CC, but it's actually DD. So I don't know, maybe an earlier iteration it was CC and and they changed it. Um, it um, before it does that, it it actually uh, goes off. The bins are what the resolution is. Bin bin equals four is twenty five by twenty five. Um, display equals five is, uh, you know, several, like it turns the LCD on, it turns, uh, either USB on or off. It, um, turns the UART on or off. Um, and there's different combinations of those that you can do. Um, that one sets the frame rate at 10 frames per second. Um, so yeah, one of the one of the first things it does is it looks for the head of the stream. I'm not seeing. Oh, there it is, right here. Yeah, raw data dot find equals frame head. Um, then the next thing it does is after the frame head, there's a, a length for the packet. Um, so and that's that's the data length. Um, there's also the frame length embedded in that if you want to use that. Uh, what else is there? Oh, it looks it out of that. It gets the what the resolution is either 100 by 100 or 50 by 50 or 25 by 25. Um, hey, Ray. Yeah. Why? Why overwrite the video and then manipulate it? Why can't you just put it in a separate array and use that separate array to do what you want to do? Um, that's the only way to get data out of the device is either through the USB or through um, um, yeah, but I mean, port. yeah, but out of the USB, it's it it's coming out as a series of pixel. You know, it's a it's a pixel stream, right? You have a head, and a and then you have a x number of pixels, and then it's in that what's going on? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, so so instead of trying to send that to the video, why not just send it to memory and mess with it in memory? It seems like it would be faster. Um, memory in the OpenMVH7? Uh, yeah, I guess. Yeah. Um, that's pretty much the only way to get it over there, as far as I know. Um, is through, you know, one of these ports here. So, Well, okay. You're somehow you're sending it to video memory. That's what I figure you're doing. Oh, you know. Yeah, basically, it's there's a frame buffer in. Uh, yeah, and, you're, change, and you're changing and you're changing the frame buffer or updating the frame buffer. Yeah. Okay. Uh, frame ID. Let's see. 
okay. Yeah, it's actually stuffing it in frame data, which is frame tail, frame head. Uh, okay, where the heck is it? Data, there's a plus equal sign somewhere. Okay, now I can't seem to find it. How much memory is on your camera, other, other than the frame buffer? Well, I know um, if I overrun the buffer, um, yeah, I get a memory allocation area error at like um, 900,000, so quite a bit. I'm not, I'm not certain what came on just the plain open MVH7. I know the plus had more memory than the, uh, than the non plus, but, um, yeah. Okay. Frame tail. Where is that? So when you're taking video, okay. On mm -hmm. the H H7 is, does the frame, buffer load all the pixels in the camera even though you ask it for only say quarter VGA or does it only put a quarter VGA image in the buffer otherwise where does where where does the dis, where does it get cut down is it is it after it's grabbed the image or does it grab a different size image because then that would suggest that there might be frame buffer left over if you took a little bit. Um, you basically uh, on um, this IDE you can basically tell it what size image um, just by the you know like here it's IMG equals Image dot image twenty five by twenty five, grayscale. Yeah, well, I guess what I'm getting at though is, yeah, I know you can tell it that that's what you're interested in. Yeah. But, that, but is that just? Are you just reaching in to a certain part of the frame buffer? But the frame buffer has a whole shebang in it, whatever it is. You know. Um, no, if you if you um, set it up here. I mean, does it actually change the camera then? So to, to look for a smaller, smaller part of the uh, sensor, you know, the, the image or sensor? Yeah. Does it only use part of the image sensor if you ask for it? Or is the whole image sensor red? I think I'm trying to get myself clear here. Yeah. Um, no, it, it's actually um, like if in this mode, I'm, I'm setting up... Uh, bin equals four as you know basically i want an image that's 25 by 25 and if i look at the frame length the total length frame length i think was uh 641 so 625 of that is um you know the individual pixels pixels or, or distance measurements mm -hmm. from the sensor um, yeah but uh, but like I say, is OpenCV and maybe Kareem can pop in here. Okay, the camera, you know, it's just it it flips its shutter, it takes an image. Yeah. Okay. All right. It takes an image. I don't think you can go in and say, well, give me a quarter of this image. I think it it just takes when the shutter flips, it takes the whole image. Then while it's so that's in your buffer. And then OpenCV says, well, I'm only interested in this quarter part of it. Mm -hmm. All right. And so there, it all it does is address where in the frame buffer to start looking. It doesn't, do you know what I mean? It, it's, You're talking it's, about region of interest, right? Well, no. Yeah. No, yeah. Well, no, I'm saying like, it's even more in front of that, Kareem. What, if mm -hmm. you go in and say, I want quarter VGA. Okay. So I only yeah. want, but let's say my camera is a VGA camera. I know it's more than that, but I'm just trying to get it simple. Yeah. So if you went to a VGA, you know, your thing gets 640 by 480. Every time you take a, every time your sensor reads, it takes a full image. All right. But it puts that somewhere and in, into some sort of buffer. 
And then OpenCV goes in and says, well, according to this, you only want quarter VGA. So therefore, I'm going to start, you know, in a certain location in the frame buffer. And that's going to be like the new zero, zero. And the other end is going to be the end of the buffer. So the camera keeps seeing the same thing. It doesn't care what you ask for. Isn't that right? Um, <clears throat> or am I wrong? Am I, you know? Yeah. I know with the open MVH seven, if, you know, up here, you, you say, uh, okay, this one quarter, quarter VGA two is it's a special designator for the display, which is, it's only the LCD on the back of the open MV H seven only has 128 by 160 pixels. Right, yeah. Um, the, I, I know if you, you can go to like three Qs and even four Qs, if you go to like quarter, 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 quarter VGA, it's something like 30 by 40. It's okay. very small. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to average out those pixels. Does it go Over faster? Whatever. Does it go faster? Yeah, it goes. It can go very fast at that. You know, in other mm -hmm. words, your frame rate can be very fast if you have a a very coarse image, not not very many pixels in it at all. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I used to use for um, the challenge line following course. It was only thirty by forty. Um, now with the with the rolling shutter sensor on the OpenMV, that's what it used to do. On the global shutter. It actually took, and it was centered, you know, on the, basically, uh, like if you put some image in the in the front of the camera, even though it was only 30 pixels by 40 pixels, it was centered. If you went with the, um, with the global shutter, it actually just took a quarter that, you know, like the top corner of the image, because that's um, like up here is where zero, you know, pixel zero, zero is. Mm -hmm. So when they're, you know, they're counted off in row column fashion. So down, you know, down over here might be pixel 25, 25 or something. Well, okay, over there in, in this image. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, so yeah, the two, the two sensors work, you know, differently. I was kind of surprised by that. Um, and I actually preferred it to do the, the averaging and the centering, but it just took you know, the first, like a little, a little corner of the whole image. And it was not centered with, uh, with the global shutter. Mm. But yeah, so, so basically so there, there's the camera itself and it typically has different modes that it might be in. So I don't know, but I don't know anything about the open MV specifically, yeah. uh, but in most situations, cameras can usually sample at different frame sizes, but mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a limited set, right? So there's a configuration stage where you set it up for the, the, um, the resolution that's basically closest to what you want or yeah. closest to your starting point. Uh, but then you may have to, then you may have a pipeline and that's basically a bunch of mem copies into uh, probably downsampled uh, matrices that are, you mm -hmm. know, your, uh, you know, whatever your small, the smallest useful size, because the, anytime you decrease the amount of data you're working on, the, the, the more you're going to speed it up, um, lighten the load. Mm -hmm. So, um, but, but that's more a function of your specific application. Uh, and then there's separately from all of that might be your output where you want to visualize, you want to give human feedback. Um, but uh, uh, so you might have yet another stage in the pipeline that's just about processing the frames and painting over them to show uh, show relevant features that um, humans want to pick up. But so I'm not quite sure exactly what your question is, Doug. Yeah. Uh, which which part of that pipeline are you talking? Okay. About? Well. Okay. So if I have a camera, that, let's say it's. For any, it's 1080p, okay? It's a 1080p camera. Yeah. All right. And I have, in that, I have different resolutions that I can set in the camera. It can be 1080p, 
It can be 720p. It can sure. be 640. Okay. I don't think it'd go any lower than that, but let's say it, that's where it went. So it has the camera itself. So does so if I'm in the 640 mode, 640 by 480 mode, does it literally only read the sensor 648 pixels out of the sensor, or does it read the full 1080 and downsize it? You know, that's up to your cameras. Uh, that, that's up to the com camera component, right? Right. If, if you can request a our pre downsampled image yeah. from what, whatever is whatever is physical full resolution, uh, generally it'll give it to you already downsampled, down right? Okay. And so it's not really your uh, uh, your off cam. It, it's not your uh, normal processor. That's that's having to do that, but then you might still want to downsample even further. Well, that's I guess that's what I was trying to get at. Then next, so the next step in the line. So let's say I asked for six forty by four eighty. Okay. Yeah. Let's and say that's so the it, lowest that it will give you. Right. Yeah. And so that gives it to me. Now, in his his OpenCV command. But he, if he asks for a quarter VGA, he is he's actually getting he's not telling the camera to go. Well, let's okay. Let me try to keep it straight. So let's say when he gives the command, open CV, go give me six forty by four eighty. He's not setting the camera mode, is he? Or is he? I think in uh, at least. For the OpenMVH7, um, it is like. Hold on a second. I can. Do you see? Do you see what I'm saying? Is he? It can he? I guess another way of looking at it would be: Can he change the camera mode using the OpenCV command that he's using to ask for resolution? Yeah. Okay, I know. Like, um, like any of the sensor dot. It it's, pertains to the camera, so like you know, there it's you know it's showing. Okay, I could do a sensor reset, which I did. I can do a sensor set uh, pixel format. In that case, it's sensor dot RGB uh, RGB five six five. So it's taking sixteen bits to represent the color of each pixel. Right. Um, can you set the, resolution or or mode with that or whatever they call it? Well, there's there's set go, uh, go. frame size right there, which okay. is in that case it's the special one to work with the LCD because it's it's only got yeah, 100. Slide over there. to set frame rate. Put your so we can see the pop up on the set frame rate. What is it? Oh, set Great. frame rate. Okay. So uh, frame size. Yeah, I'm sorry. Frame size. Yeah. So there's um, where is it? For yeah. The cam do, so it sets the size for the cam or module. Right. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. All right. And so, the only one, only pixels you have available to you after you've set that frame is what's in the frame. Yeah. Like if you go, let's see. What is it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven down. It's QQ, QQ, four Qs. VGA is actually forty by thirty, and I can't move my cursor over it; otherwise, it'll disappear. Um, I don't know if you can see six. that there. Okay, got it. Okay, cool, cool. And that's that's what I used on the other one, but like in this one, because I'm, I have the the OpenMV um, LCD on the back of the camera. Um, you know, they they say to use this one because it's not, you know, it's not just quarter quarter VGA. It's I think a little bit smaller. Um, so let's see what's. VGA, I think VGA is... 640 by 480. 480, yeah. yeah. So take two quarters of that, and it should be a little bit smaller than that. Yeah, it would be 160 by something. Yeah, yeah. Does anybody remember when VGA was cool? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh... So anyway, yeah, you 
Yeah, you, you wanna you wanna set your uh, incoming frame buffer to. It's got to be something that the camera allows, right? That it can yeah. provide, and that's sort of separate from the more detailed processing usually. But you want to downsample. You want to get rid of data as as early as possible in the pipeline. Once you know, once you're beyond experiments, and you know you don't need it, because yeah. you know you're just wasting processing cycles if you're uh, uh, processing on too large of a frame. Yeah, I guess the question was. If he, he's somehow being able to send this image that he's got on the screen right now. He's able to send this to his other camera, and it's. Well, is it being assembled in the camera, or is it being assembled well, I, in the OpenCV I, pipeline? I think it's being assembled. I think no, it's not in the camera. I think it's being assembled into the same memory as the output screen. No, he's probably just compositing the two. I didn't, I didn't see that bit of code, but we're ready. Yeah. You're, doing. you're probably like taking two uh, two matrices and, and you treating one as an overlay on the other. Um, yeah, more or less like the um, what is it here? Okay, the only the only image that I set up. Um, that it actually sticks um, the pixel data into is this one here, uh, IMG. Um, and that's, you know, basically, let's see if I can get it to come up. And I do a, a copy the frame buffer. Um, so that's... That's that that's other image. In, in memory, basically, or, or saying what size the image or the amount of memory is that you know so you can not overrun it and put it in there um but where is it uh raw data where is that statement yeah so it it basically keeps sticking in it, you know it's a plus equal so it reads um reads how many bytes there are in the buffer read bytes is um for the open MVH7, you can it'll read more than one byte if more than one byte is in the buffer. Um, sticks it into raw data and then later on creates a frame. Uh, where is the show me function? Yeah, it's basically takes frame data and um, here is where you can you can colorize it if you want by using that map. It's it's a little bit different statement, but you actually set the individual pixels. In this case, the the grayscale represents the the distance in centimeters. So you're mm -hmm. setting x, y, and whatever gray value that you know that pixel in centimeters was, uh, and then the way that you can or was it the way that you can display it is just you know lcd dot display image and i probably changed something before i took okay. it apart and put it back together just a few minutes ago but uh okay. it, it's okay. superimposed the image up here it was a little 25 by 25 you know replica of what you saw on the max sense a010 but in, in grayscale, not in color. Mm -hmm. And that's all I, you know, I really wanted to do is to be able to get it in to the open in VH7 uh, and then look at individual like uh, lines in that, you know, I'd have 25 lines of 25 pixels um, at this okay. point, because that's, you know, that's what I set it up as. Okay, I, I think I understand what's going on. I appreciate it, Ray. Um, sure. And everybody else for putting up with me. Oh, you're fine. Anyway, it worked at home. <laughs> Wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still at home, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, so somebody else, take the mic, please. <laughs> Open mic time. We didn't have any cue beyond this. So, Michael, what you got? Well, uh, I'm going to start to make girl. So, 
so I'm not yelling over. Um, I showed you this a few months, you know, probably last year. You know, I'm starting on that my uh, another claw machine, and I showed you this, but I'm going to kind of show you. It's really in the rough, real bad. So, but y'all can probably let's see here. Let me, let me do this. Y'all see it back there? Let me. Oh, yeah. yeah. Y'all see that back there? Yeah. Okay. You see the claw hanging here? Yeah. All right, now. I told y'all, I don't know if I remember. So it's going to be on this turntable, on this Lazy Susan, it, it, driven with a motor. As a matter of fact, I'm going to probably try to drive it with one of those yellow motors. But anyway, um, I've got it to where it's time. And I told y'all months ago where you can kind of see that it's, you know, it's in concept right now. But but the uh, as I actuate the, the servos, it tries. It stays relatively at the same height. Oh, I've got. Oops. Uh oh. Just dropped the thing. Let me see if I can do it this way. Y'all can see it better, maybe like that. So I'm gonna go out, and then I'll pinch you to push a button, and it'll drop the claw and pick up the item. Right. But here's what I was wanting to kind of show. These are all, it's printed right now, 3D printed in scrap filament. That's why it's all different colors. Because, you know, you're using up old filament, so that's why it's in multicolor like that. Mm -hmm. So, of course, I got buttons for, for a, a debugging that I can move one at a time here. See that? I can move one at a time and one arm at a time. Well, I told you I could. What's going on there? There we go. Anyway, let me reboot it. I got some bugs to work out. There we go. Reboot it. Uh oh. My deep bug buttons aren't working. I'm about to pull something loose. I did. Well, anyway, never mind. But the is working. But hey, this ain't really what I was wanting to tell you about tonight. I want to share uh, uh, something in the future that. If I work it out, I will. I drew all of that. I drew all that in, in a FreeCAD. And FreeCAD has an assembly uh, uh, bench, uh, uh, workbench. And that assembly workbench, they got about three of them, they're add-ons, that you can animate. So I'm going to see how far I can, I can animate this in FreeCAD without having to, you know, and, Draw them up without doing some 3D printing and, and test it on the computer. I think that's going to be a neat project. And because uh, I got all this, everything you see here has already been, you know, drawn in FreeCAD and printed out. And um, so, and FreeCAD is, is an open source, you know, 3D modeling deal. So it's 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 programmed by volunteers. So so I think that's pretty cool. Um, what else was I going to say? Uh, We'll see how it works. Also, it's got a it's, FreeCAD is written in Python and C plus plus, and you can you can uh, you know program some micro some uh, micros that uh, uh, macros that you can put to, to uh, you know buttons on the panel. Mm -hmm. And I might try to to do a little programming and 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 you know to actuate this from the panel in the video. I think that's going to be a neat project. That's not all I got to say. So. Okay. Uh, yeah. See how that goes. I'll share it with you if I make any progress. Sometimes I just get sidetracked and do something else, but yeah. that's what's in my mind right now. That's all I got. Okay. Shit. That's cool. Yeah, that's it. And nice and colorful on the class too. There. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're all cheap, so you know. <laughs> oh, They're all under five hundred. So. Hey, anyway, that's all I got. Though. I'll keep you updated on that. Okay, Joe. I have something to show on the arm thing. Thing. So let me click on. Let me go again. No. Hey, John, what you got? Oh, great. So uh, one more click. So speaking of the arm, uh, this arm is the version three out there now. So if you. Cap up with this. It's been a couple of years, and the more important thing to me is that I actually now has 
instructions for it. So let me click there. It actually looked pretty good. Instruction-wise, it looks like, you know, it goes down to the finer details about building the thing. So, so in case anybody wants to build an arm, rocket size. Can you put the link into the chat? I will. So those are the two parts to that. And as I said, it can be well in plastic or wood. But it's a pot sized little arm. And then the other thing, uh, hopefully I can click. Hey, John. Yeah. John, before you drop that one out, can you, does he have any pictures of, so you can kind of get a feel for its relative size? It's pocket size. It's truly, well, you can see there like, you know, it's a handheld version. Okay. And let's see if we can get more of a finish. Okay. okay, there we go. Okay, thanks. I appreciate That's it. I'd say it's a pocket size. It's a nice size. Not too big, not too small. <laughs> and well put together instruction-wise. <laughs> so it meets those cr criteria in my mind. Hence, that's why I'm bringing that up. And then a variation I had not seen. So this, if you want a little strangeness, then there's this one out there. Now, okay, where you basically have your mortar in the center, and it looks like that. Oh! It slides. That's pretty cool. So yeah, that's a different design. I may print that out. So we'll see if I have it out by this week or so. So this one, so, you know, so right now. John, so is this a, a jaw? Are we looking straight into a yeah, jaw? Yeah, we're straight into it. So literally it's, yeah. So it's so a parallel jaw. It's yeah. a parallel jaw. That's good. That's cool. Right, and that's why I hadn't seen this type of design before. And it looks like it's nice, simple, doesn't require lots of nuts and bolts. Which I'm like going, hmm, so I may print this one out this weekend. We'll see. <laughs> I might I might think about implementing that in my in my new claw machine, something like that. That looks kinda unique. Yeah, I'm well that's what I'm thinking. Looking for when I take these to the kids, carnival, you know that it looks kinda cool, you know, unique. Right. They can kinda go, Oh, look at that kind of thing. So that's my goal. Do and, they uh, have a do they have an automation guy? Don't think so. Is that okay. No, I doubt it. Nope. But you know, it's pretty straightforward. I mean, <laughs> just looking at this, you know, this turns and these goes in and out based on yeah, you know, the slide and fatter. Pretty good. So yeah, that's why I'm. Definitely, this one's interesting. Yeah, I'm hoping to eventually get a claw, so eventually we can get a robot into the can contest. Thing. Right. So this is one, especially this one. I'm thinking, ooh, this would be easy to connect to the front of a robot. Without. Hey, John, does that say it's a chest gripper? Um. Uh, yeah. I'm just wondering what a chest gripper is. Well, based on, uh, we can go click here. <laughs> based on this one, no, 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 not there. There, uh, that's why we think a chess oh, piece would be like. Chess pieces. He's okay. probably going to try to automate it playing a chess game by having yeah. the computer move its pieces. Right. But the difference in the front of the heads, you know, as I said, it's a different type of head. This one, uh, yeah, you know, this one is more of the scissors <laughs> technique. Yeah. You have the more in the gears and nuts and bolts to put it together. Uh, is, yeah, you can see that well there. You might have already said this, but that's a me arm, right? Uh, I think, so. yeah, it's a me arm for version three. So yeah, they have had a couple of those out there. Uh, I think 
Where are we at? Take a verse. Yeah. If we go. Same. Yeah, that he's had several versions, but that's the latest one. So yeah, here's version one, which was back in 2014. So yeah, it's a ways back there. Uh, if you went to, you know, now I've built one of these. I don't have it currently up. Yeah, I have no idea where I put it. But the po a pocket clock is another interesting sort of tool, but it doesn't drip. <laughs> it just writes. <laughs> so, they're going to build a little wireable drawing things as another one to play with. Two, two servos. They're pretty, pretty wild. Oh yeah, it's pretty neat. Especially when it starts putting numbers on that. So yeah, it's a pretty neat one to run too. And there's several variations of that out. So... And then let's see what... Oh, else was I going to show? No, I guess I can go grab it from... Here. Where are we at? Okay, well, maybe not. Oh, that is the spot. Okay, let me show the one other thing that. Uh, okay, and then the other thing which. This is sort of cute. I don't know if you've ever seen the Rel Smart iBot. There's a new version out there for the chassis to make it more like a truck bed. So that's the other cute thing I saw tonight. And this one's, there are variations of variations of that, but this is sort of the latest version. So as you can see, Here's the original one. And it's small and compact. What's that? What's that one with the cannon? It looks like a cannon on it. What is the antenna? That? Oh, that's a uh, marker? It's a marker. Yeah, a pen marker. And as I said, this one, they have, have lots of variations of it out there. And now they have a road truck chassis built for it. So that's another real cute robot. <laughs> so yeah, I'll put the links in for, well, the three. Yeah. Cool. So that's why I have a, this Sage. Cool beans. Yeah, I'm gonna look at that. Uh, I'm gonna look at that clamp. Yeah, sure. especially for the arm. Yeah, it definitely looks very neat to me. Alrighty, well, uh, open mic night. So, what's next? Um, uh, Mary's not here, but I would like to thank Mary. Excellent. Um, last, uh, uh, it wasn't last night, but it was last Friday. Um, damn, it wasn't Monday. Yeah, it wasn't last night, it was last Friday. Um, I started talking to my uh, channel about optical flow meters, optical flow sensors. And that sort of thing, and trying to detect movement because uh, the Hugo bot I was just putting on the shelf up here because I'm clearing off my desk. Because tomorrow night we'll be doing, we'll be building a CV01, which is Creality's low end single arm laser engraver thing that I got cheap from Micro Center, right? And uh, 
So I was moving all that stuff off of there and doing those kind of things. But uh, in order to, and actually it'd be good that I clean it off anyhow, because I was looking and um, we were showing an optical flow sensor and Murray put out a couple of videos a couple of years ago with some proof of concepts and some things he was playing with uh, by down looking, by looking down through a hole and that sort of thing, showing them off, showing them how they work. And um, I was showing those off to my push string. So I think that's how I'm going to try to do some odometry. Um, I know it's harder for him. I know, I know you told me I've taken that, un, you know, under advisement. Trust me, I have. And uh, we're going to see how that uh, works on uh, the Hugo bot here. And then we'll worry about some IMUs or something that's error 90 degrees or orientation or something. We'll worry about that secondly. Um, and because um, I was looking at odometry and stuff and I got to, I got a bunch of, started looking at a bunch of videos. How do you do odometry and some other things? And I saw these one person says, Bleh. Yeah, this is how you do it, and this is how we, after a lot of complex calculations, it was a, I think it was a first team that did it, and I got to look at the robots, and how they did odometry was they literally put omnidirectional wheels on 90-degree angles to one another and use the encoders. Um, as the robot moved, the omni wheels would do things and move in accordance with that, and they just track the encoders off the omni wheel movement, and that's how they did the. Uh, that's how they did o odometry. I don't have an example to give you, but if you can imagine the four four sets of wheels on the outside, then literally four sets of wheels on the inside that are all omni. So no matter which way you moved, one of those wheels would be rotating, uh, in accordance, or one or more of those wheels would be rotating in accordance with the movement, and then you can track. Um, uh, uh, distance traveled and off those things off the encoder and that's how they did it. Literally like the old school mouse. You know, if you took a mouse apart back uh, uh, back in the 80s, 90s, is it 80s? Do the math, carry the one, yeah, in the 80s. Um, and the 90s where they were all mechanical mice. You know, you had to clean them out every now and then because they got rough and they did optical encoding on that and they're literally doing the same thing by just having that work and I'm like you know I, I that's cool and all but I would like to do something different so and the only thing that I've said I've, re I've really figured out so far with the optical encoders is that my surface matter so I've got to train it to a surface so if I'm doing something and I have multiple surfaces like uh, so like a Roomba it runs across the carpet runs across the uh, a wood floor that runs across the tile floor, every one of those surfaces is going to register slightly differently in the, uh, with the optical flow sensor. And so uh, for the contest or wherever I'm at, uh, the surface needs to be somewhat consistent and because that interactive room at the maker space is bumpy and not level. Thanks Carl for showing us all that. Uh, <laughs> um, as it is, at least the surface is a decently, uh, uh, it's not a plain flat white anything. It's, it has some variegated. Yes, yeah, decently variegated. So I think I should be able to tune it to track distances and stuff like that once I get a handle on it, if I ever get a handle on it. But we're going to, we're going to order a few of those and see what we got going on there. I am. Oh, I'm sorry, Harold. No, that's right. And then that's possible. And that was, and I, I really, I, the reason I started all that was Murray was here. I'd be thanking him a lot because um, that he was able to do that proof of concept. I was able to demonstrate how it sort of works. And um, we got, uh, not that we're doing things on committee, but Mike, you've been by the Twitch stream. You know how I, uh, yeah, people's opinion, and we get together on that thing and go, yep, that's what we should be doing. And that's where we're going to go. I'll, right? probably, I'll probably visit tomorrow night too because I'm going to be unbusy. So, okay, well, come on by, you know. Yeah. We're doing stuff I've never done before. I might put an eye out or burn a finger off or something. I don't know, but we'll see about it. <laughs> Looking at, laughing at my, laughing at, laughing at my pain. Way to go, Mike. Thanks. <laughs> no, but uh, uh, 
uh, you know, so we're gonna we're gonna work on some of those projects till I uh, get parts ordered and they come in doing some some of these other things I've had sitting on my back shelf for a while. I want to play, but uh, yeah, you know, I'm uh, instrumental in figuring and making that a uh, a case for the way we need to go for the moment. Anyway. Yeah, Harold uh, uh, Murray was working with I think it's Pinaromi. Pin, yeah, Pin to, yeah. Are, yeah, are you use are you using their uh, sensors? Is that your plan? I have not ordered those sensors yet. There are currently two sensors out that do that. They're based. They're both based on the PMW uh, or PWM. PMW, PWM, pulse width modulated. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's not pulse. It's pulse width modulated, but it's not. But it's different. No, it's the PMW is the part part, it's part series. Number. It's a part number series. Okay. Yeah, and it's a thirty nine oh one. And um, I have found the Pimeroni one out there for about 22 bucks. I have found a generic um, Ally Express from Amazon kind of thing, doing the same sort of thing for about 25 bucks. And so I thought I was going to order one of each of those kind of things and, um, and uh, put them to the test to see what we can find out, see which one's easier to do. I, I suspect the Pimeroni one is probably going to be easier to deal with only because the Pimeroni folks, I'm, I know I'm, I'm acting like a Murray, parroting Murray here. The Pimeroni folks make some really nice stuff. Their boards tend to be really nice and, and all that sort of thing. So, um, Well, he worked with them and uh, they got a different focal length uh, lens or something. To, yeah. To, there was a different version. The first one that they had was optimized for drones. Yeah, uh, and then this one is optimized for floor dwelling robots, basically. Okay, okay. Yeah, and, and, and there's also not there's a thirty nine oh one, and there's also another another one of these top sensors that was mentioned in the comments. And I haven't done that research to figure out what that one is to make sure I understand a couple of the different varieties of stuff, and probably order one of each of these things and mm -hmm. bring up some test things to see which one seems to work better or worse or whatever on the thing. Mm -hmm. That'll and be cool. Then, yeah, and then once we figure out if that works or not, again, I hope it's going to work, but we'll figure that out. Then we'll, then we'll start playing around with uh, uh, IMUs again. And I don't want to use a 6050. What I really want to do is he, I, uh, I just checked yesterday. So uh, Adafruit has both BNO 055s and BNO 8085s in stock right now. Mm -hmm. And those do uh, some kind of fusion thing where there's a bunch of math that they'll do for you and give you a thing. Now, mm -hmm. how, how, are, how stable are they? That, I know we've done a lot with the 055s here. I don't know if we've done a lot with the 085s. And I don't know if there's a big enough difference to... I mean, the cost difference in there is between the two doesn't seem to be a whole lot to me yeah Harold you might look back uh, Chris Netter did a lot with the that 085 and if you look if you look back in the the chat records yeah for, for BNO 085 you might be able to pinpoint those meetings and then go see what he said back then see what he said on yeah, yeah if I remember right it had something to do with what use cases they were tuned for yeah, one was for the Roomba or a Roomba's type thing, and the other one I think was more general. Yeah, something like that. I think yeah. the 085 is the more spe special purpose one. Right? They, um, they, they, they do make a big deal out of this fusion, using the word fusion, and yeah. using Euler equations and that kind of stuff to give you information. So yeah. I, I, I don't know if that's actually helpful or not, though. But Oh, yeah, it's, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> you just, you, it just gives you a heading, you know. You don't have to, you don't have to take and try to do the same thing with your gyro and and, yeah, and uh, mash them together and do that yeah, stuff. In yeah, real time. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. do that stuff inside of the Arduino or some other bit of code. Yeah, after we get right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so, yeah. So that's that's kind of my plan working forward on those. I, but we're going to take a, I say a little bit of a break, and I'm, I say I've got laser printers. I got one of those 3018 CNC machines over here sitting in a box for however long that one of these gets thrown together, and we'll do something 
with that, I suppose. But it just depends yeah. on how long it takes me to get. Uh, uh, I got vacation coming up, going to Topeka and a couple other things. So, kind of depends on how all that stuff works out, right? Yeah. What sort of thirty eighteen did you get? Um, just... Let me look at the box here. Well, while he's looking at. It. I did post the link for the gripper, so okay. one, one yeah. can look on the tap part. Yes. Well, I gotta go, guys. Nice to meet you again. Okay, we'll see yeah. you, Mike. Yeah. Hey, Mike. Okay, this is a 3018 Pro, made in China. Yeah. Micro Center is selling. And this is uh, so it's roughly one hundred and thirty or forty dollars. Well, if it's what I'm thinking you're talking about, it said, said one sixty nine when I bought it, and I can't, you know. Yeah, well, I got a laser. <laughs> I finally got it put together, but yeah, in the meantime, it dropped fifty dollars in price. So yeah. Yeah, so that's the, that's the sum total of the markings on this box that I got yeah. you that have any relevance whatsoever. So it's some Chinese knockoff 3018. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, because I have one of those now, too. And i was just wondering if uh, you had the same one. Well, I bet, I bet if we did not get the same maker, manufacturer, I'm going to bet because how these things work, we got the same one. <laughs> well, actually, I don't know. The one I've got is does look different than that. Let me. It's called a Com Grow. Okay. Uh, one of the reasons I looked at that, I said, "Cool, we get that." It's got the Pro thing, which it means it have uh, some kind of probably upgraded bearings or laid screws or something on there. Uh, the um, what it is is the slides are the the. The regular one had eight millimeter slides, and the one you have, it's got I think ten millimeter slides. Similar slides, okay. They might be they might be twelve millimeter slides. Okay, so I can't remember. It's, 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 that's what's got upgrade. I yeah. got you. And so I was looking. One of the things that I in the back of my head, I'm looking. I, it, these are similar enough that if I wanted to make a thirty eighteen into like uh, give me a larger bed. That's a pretty, uh, you know, for 50, 60 bucks, I can buy the the, the kit yeah. from Ally Express to extend the bed if I like doing that stuff. So I yeah. said, okay, we'll take this. Well, I just put in uh, the uh, the name of it in there. It's equivalent to a pro, but I, I like the format a little bit better. Oh, okay. Yeah, because in it, the original 3018s, the long... The long axis is the the long axis is uh, the x axis, and the short axis is the y axis. Okay. And then on this congro, I think the difference is the short axis is the x, and the long axis is the y. That means the what do you call it? The sled. The, the tower, I don't know, a tower or whatever it is, is shorter. So, so it's supposed to be a little bit, a little bit stronger. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I wouldn't, I mean, my, my thing with this CNC is, I'll, and also with this little bitty laser, I, you know, if I can cut some paper or cardboard or something, yeah. and I don't imagine I can do much more than that. Well, some of those laser modules now are getting pretty dang strong. Yeah, I was looking at I was looking at what they're doing. They, they're like in this. Well, this is not. This is a the router or the laser that you're talking I, well, about. I got both going on there, right? Yeah, so, you can get you can get a, a laser for this router, so you uh, can have both if you want. Oh, that's cool! I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, and it's I mean, it's, have what I was looking at front. with some of the uh, some of the laser modules now. Is yeah, uh, you you know they're not CO two, but you can get a forty watt laser out of one of these things. And what they're doing is they're taking six or eight six watt lasers 
and stacking them up and using optics to drive all the light into the single point. So they're using they're using laser diodes uh, of, of the six to ten watt variety, but then they're stacking them up so they're all combining into one spot. Wow. And now they're getting the wattage. Is that better or worse or good? I I don't know. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've seen them. I want to say I've seen them cut three millimeter plexiglass with some of them now. So, but they're you know they're they're not. I'll your, tell you more precise. They're the more expensive in ones. In a week or two. Yeah. yeah. Like I did get my 10 watt one put together finally and did one cut with it, but it was only like a three millimeter depth. Yeah. So, okay. I don't know how many people are going to have their phones buzzing, but mine's buzzing. So. <laughs> yeah. We're coming. I didn't hit yet. So, uh, let me. Sh- Share something while we listen briefly to it. I will tell you one other thing that's uh, cool, and I'm still in under investi- investigation. Last seen wearing a gray sweatshirt, gray sweatpants with white stripe and black house shoes. Suspect is 34 year old black male. Okay. Call 911 with information. So. Hopefully y'all are not having too much noise from me in the process. But here's one I see at Micro Center as of today. So that's why I was saying that. I, I bet that's what it. I bet that's what it is, or close to it, anyways. See, and they have it now at one nineteen. Same price. It's exactly the same price before they gave the a fifty dollar reduction. Well, okay. Is it still that price? As of tonight, yes. Wow. So that's why I say this is not a bad price for what you get. I have one of these, but I think I paid like two hundred dollars or whatever it was a couple of years back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, was, I don't know what happened. I was, I was innocently walking around Micro Center instantly, and then and all of a sudden something made me go get a basket, and somehow the the thirty eighteen showed up, ended up in the basket somehow. I don't know how that happened. You you can't have an empty basket. That's one of the laws of life. <laughs> so you, your first mistake was picking up the basket. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, you can see on the back there. I mean, yeah, they they're all basically the same. Yeah. I mean, in my case, I, I don't have the mill, the wood, well, the whatever that is, wood mill on the side. But yeah, you know, I, I don't know. Sure, I'm pretty same. certain that's what mine looks like. Pretty certain. And then, uh, yeah. And but if you're into the laser, they have the laser one I have uh, at around 120 something. Yeah, that one, that one right there. That's exactly that one at 129. Yep, yep, that's exactly what I'm going to put together tomorrow night. Oh, uh, it's real easy. Wow. I can tell you. <laughs> so I'll show you mine. <laughs> it's put together already. And, and as soon as it gets it's together, we'll start, we'll start cutting. We'll start engraving, cutting, doing whatever, burning fingers. I don't know exactly what. But we'll, we're going to play with it, and then, uh, and then, because I've never played with it. I'm, I, you know, like I say I've never played with these things before. I've got a bunch of uh, uh, two mil wood blanks over here, plywood wood blanks. It will do paper. Oh, and your let me unshare the screen so I can you can see it back. Oh. At the very least, I don't know. You can't see it at the moment because I got it off, Mike. But this is how it looks when it gets put together. It looks like a bit plain right now. But anyway, so, yeah, it's very simple. Four screws, slap it on, uh, like, uh, yeah. Basically, there's four, yeah, the four screws that you slap it on. Real simple, put together. But this one, don't expect it to cut more than maybe about two millimeters. Yeah, I've got some of that two millimeters uh, plywood. Okay. For the birch I mean, stuff. it does paper. It'll do the very relatively soft cardboard. And it'll do, um, yeah. And it definitely will do engraving nicely, though. Yeah. That's the key I got this mainly was to mark leather. Because one of the first things I want to do, you see my uh, logo up here? What happens? It'll do that. I don't know if you see my hand. 
but my logo's here, but the board goes up to here. And the guy that built it for me specifically left me this space so that when I got a laser engraver, we could put, we could engrave like established and give me a, a year or something on the top of it and do it. And we'll do that on the stream too, uh, to make it, to make everything work, make that guy happy. No, and, it, and I don't know what, well, they originally had their own software, but you may wind up using a different software. I forget what they change out. Yeah, we'll, we'll figure that out. I, I'm, not, I'm not ready to go buy a light burn, I'll tell you that, but that seems... That no, seems you don't really need to me. buy the light burn. I mean, you, unless you want to spend the $30, the software that comes, the base software, I call it, Yeah, it works, and it works nicely for imaging. Okay. I, I don't necessarily... Uh, I'm not... Uh, I probably will not buy a light burn yet, but I see a, a, a license of light burn in my future if I do very much of this stuff. Yeah, well... They have the, the other, and I forget the name off him because it's on the other computer. But, uh, yeah, they, it has bundle with software, and you know, one option is not light burn. Okay. I would say for what year one for that other one will work sufficiently. When it said laser, G, laser G, G, gimbal or something like that. Okay. Yeah, uh, I, uh, I use light burn on my K40, and I love it. It's, it yeah. is a great it is a great software package, and oh, no. if you're a member of, of DMS, you can get a single single seat license, not the normal three seat license, for uh, uh, a reduced price. Oh, you just tell them you. I I don't I can't remember what it is, but it's like thirty bucks or something. Like that. It's it's a little less. Yeah, that may be worth it. Become a member for a month to get the license. Well, <laughs> uh, I'm just saying it's if you have. So you can go even license. cheaper with the uh, other option I said. <laughs> and yeah. for the base itself, it works. <laughs> it works. I got it. Mm -hmm. I, there's one other thing I, that I started using. Um, you see this thing? That stuff. Oh, I, I, I won that. I won that from 3D uh, 3D printer node or Joel over Christmas. That's how long I've been having sitting on this thing, not wanting to mess with it because I'm like I can't mess with that. And uh, what it is, it's for uh, sticking prints to your bed. And you're like, oh, don't you do that already? Don't that work? And they, well, it does. But I'm trying to print some petgy, and I was having some problems. So I'm like, let's go check this stuff out. Now, let me tell you before I go too far, this 120 millimeter, 120 milliliter of, of, of juice here will do about 300 coatings of your bed. It's $45. Mm -hmm. It ain't cheap. It mm -hmm. ain't cheap at all. But I've got a, I was struggling with the pet G over here, covering it up. I, I tried the glue stick thing, which I hadn't tried before, and that failed miserably too. And I've tried a couple other things. Re, you know, and of course I re, uh, I say re leveled. I got uh, I got a, a touch on here, and so I went through. Uh, um, it re levels itself every time, or it gets a mesh every time it fires up. And I, I get the Z offset's the only thing got to worry about. So I went and redid all that, and it was still having a part time. So I said, what the hell, let's go watch a video. And the, and the guy goes, it does about 300 things. So you draw an X and do a circle, and then you get one of them uh, uh, aluminum brushes that you get to throw away all the time and do uh, a horizontal and a vertical striping across it so you get a, a pretty good cover. And let it dry, and it's it. There's alcohol in it, it dries real fast. And it worked just like those people said it worked. I've had a, I had a 30-hour print on Pet G. It was on there stable, just stable. And usually when I get Pet G to pull it off a of glass or whatever, it's it's stuck on there. It's not coming off. You know, you got to get on it, get the get the edge under it, and the Exacto knife really thing, and a couple other things, and scooping, scraping, and and then it pops all off. And hopefully you don't gouge yourself and you don't die and go to the hospital. Okay, um, but uh, I came in this morning after it had uh, normally. After it had finished, and normally, even this pet G, and even if it gets cold, it still doesn't pop right off. This, I walked right up to it, I picked it off the plate. <laughs> it released, phew, done. 
Can you put a link to the or write the name down in the chat? Yeah, I will. I will look up the link right now and chuck it into the thing. It's expensive though. I don't know if I'd ever would have bought it if I hadn't have won it. Yeah. You know? Let me look it up real fast, and I'll put a link in the chat and let everybody know. But that's about all I. I think that's about all I had, unless I want to make some snarky joke at somebody else's stuff somewhere. You know how that works. Uh, Ray, I haven't gotten on to you too much tonight, so, you know, I can't hear this. <laughs> I can't hear you, Ray. You're muted. Oh, uh, you got a camera on me? I got, I got you muted, Ray, because there, uh, there were some sounds coming out that weren't uh, quite working right. You can unmute yourself. I'm, I'm not sure if it was robot-y stuff. Uh, maybe your robots were talking, saying things they shouldn't talk. But. Better? Yep, there you go. Okay. Um, God, if, uh, if I move this thing, it'll probably crap out or something. Ah, okay. I'm going to try to tilt my laptop towards it. It's pretty hard to see at this scale, but that image... <laughs> <laughs> I see it. Corner I see here. it. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> um, so it looks similar to the what's what this is seeing on on its LCD. Um, of course, if I move it, it's going to be a little different. Well, we can't um, see that resolution. Yeah, it's pretty small. Uh, yeah, I don't know if pinning me would help, but yes, it helps a lot. Oh, okay. That that link that link I promised is now in the chat, and it's got videos. Stuff by Vision Miner, by the way. Okay, cool. Okay, so that's a that's a grayscale image. It's in the memory. I should be able to look at whatever pixel values I want. So whatever whatever distance that is in the field of view. Um, actually, all the image stuff. I don't really need to do it. I mean, once I get the um, oops. Got to get my thumb off the camera. Um, once I get the, you know, the information off the out of the serial port, um, you know, it it should be good enough. I mean, I, I don't really need to see the image to know that it's working or to be be able to you know manipulate the data on it. I mean, it's kind of nice that you can see it, but you don't really need to. And I'm sure it would be a whole lot faster if I just read the stuff in through the serial port and look at whatever line or whatever pixel in a line I want to look at. So anyway, cool. Took me long enough to get here, but I finally got here. <laughs> well, we actually believed you, Ray. Oh, did you? Okay. Yeah. I always, I always, I always believed you, Ray. Mm -hmm. Always. hundred percent. Bye. 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 <laughs> but that's a black star, isn't it? I mean, is it moving? The camera's count? Oh, I don't mind. Let's give Ray a black star. That's a that's a special Olympic star, I think, for well, screwing up so uh, much before you get it to be displayed. So that was it. That's a short bus star. Is that what I heard? <laughs> a what? A short bus star. Is that what I heard? A short bus. Short bus. Don't go there. Don't uh, go there. I'm terrible. I'm a terrible person. <laughs> I'm a terrible person. It's a family-oriented video. We flag it as such, so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, if, if Ray gets one, I get one for my servo as a black star. But my servo is turned. So I, 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 I want to... I don't want one, You want one, I don't Michael? Like that, but. I don't know. I thought I saw you moving the arm around with your own arm. I didn't see the, the servo as a... Yeah, what was that fishing line? Mirrors, mirrors. I was using mirrors. Did we see the fishing line? There you go. Okay. <laughs> anyway. Right. Oh, oh, and Carl, we're going right. to use. We, I got a Neo Pixel ring over here that's going to go on a mechanic robot. You know, it's because of you. Oh. oh. It's great to be inspiring. Yeah, something. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool. All right, so what else do we have here? I got a Carl. I got a question for you with your uh, uh, with your 
the robot you you know we had at the at the last competition. It, yeah, it would it would sense north. It would sense uh, magnetic north. Yeah, inside the building. Yeah, yeah, it does a reasonably good job. Okay, so my question is, you know, Ray has trouble turning around with his six can robot, and I was wondering if that could be used in the six can competition to help. Uh, you know, to help realize what direction you're pointed. I, I don't know why not. Yeah, but you're turning the magnetometers off, right, Carl? Or no? Yeah, I, I've I've tried all the different. So it's a, it's got all these different crate. This is the BNO 055 that I use. So it's got a bit, I guess the same chip but a different algorithm than the BNO 085. But mm -hmm. different company. But, but anyhow, um, nine nine DOF. IMU, and it's got all these different fusion modes. You can you can read each sensor individually, or you can let it do its best to take advantage of what it reads on them and and do its magical oil oiler angle angles based on all of them and spit you out whatever you want. So so I've tried it in full on fusion mode with all nine degrees of freedom. I've tried it with magnetometer off. I've tried it with magnetometer and and uh, I mean there's there's like six or nine six or eight different modes you can put it in and I've tried pretty much all of them and it doesn't seem to make a difference. What seems to happen with any of the except I haven't tried the raw sensors. What seems to happen with any of the fusion modes is that that thing, as long as the sensor is sitting still, it doesn't budge. I kid you not. I said it on this table on a lazy Susan and I let it sit for 24 hours and to within a tenth of a degree it didn't shift on the heading over 24 hours but then it was on a lazy Susan so all I did was I turned the lazy Susan back and forth a couple times I put it right back exactly where it was and it was off by a degree or two so the crazy thing is is that um, uh, it, it somehow drifts as it, it loses its orientation as it moves. And I don't know if that's because it, ex it expects to be in a watch or a phone, so it expects, like, over time, random motion through almost every axis, uh, or what. But I, I, I believe, and this is partly from what I've read, that what, what they do is um, they use some of the sensors to determine when it's not moving, because some of them are more accurate than others. I guess, like maybe the accelerometer versus the gyroscopes. So it it, use, it tries to use those to figure out when it's not moving. And when it's still, then it, um, I think that it attempts to, to take the biases and the drifts out. And I, I believe, and my guess is that maybe what happens is that over, over time, that error correction to take the drifts out actually introduces drifts in certain use cases. So... But the bottom line is, is that I bet you, Ray, you know, if you were to just use one of those, I mean, you've, you've, you've seen mine, even as even driving around Foursquare with those mechanic wheels and all the mechanical noise and vibration they create. I mean, it takes it a good three or four minutes to get off by a few degrees, like five or eight degrees. So in terms of aiming in generally the right direction for the goal, I think It'd be a it'd be a no brainer for your your robot. You could you can get rid of the uh, color sensitivity that you've suffered. So run the six can and the four square four square less than three minutes. You're good, right? Something like that. <laughs> yeah, it, it it was kind of weird when you when I had you know the sensor fusion mode on and um, it depended on where the course was set in that room. Um, sometimes it would be really adversely affected it like throw it off I, and i'm assuming it was just maybe where the rebar was versus yeah, could be. sure where the course was setting over it i uh, mean you know we we never put it in the same place exactly um and i also tried and i think doug also tried that um to turn off the um magnetometer and just use the gyro well primarily just the gyro i yeah, think to, yeah we always run without magnetometers yeah. The uh, you can you can always um, well the, the 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 problem 
with magnetometers or or the interesting thing about them is when they work they work great right it's very hard to tell when they stop working mm. right when the, when they're when they're perturbed by some some other electromagnetic magnetic field in the area um, and uh, while the fusion modes are supposed to sort of like recognize that right because all of a sudden now there's a disagreement between your your compass heading and your uh, I am uh, the rest Gyro of your I, yeah yep. your gyro based heading, um, and it's right supposed yeah. to sort of figure that out. It, there are limits to what it can actually figure out, and it doesn't really know what the geometry of the magnetic fields in the area is. So, if you have an unknown environment that's not profiled, then uh, using the magnet magnetometers, particularly indoors, is risky. You just don't know when it goes bad, right? And, but the, the thing I'm saying is that I've, I've turned the magnetometer off, and I've done that similar test. Well, maybe I should revisit that. But I, I can swear that I, um, I, that it didn't make much in the scenarios that I tried, the environment that I tried, the sensor fusion with and without the magnetometer didn't make that much of a difference. Yeah, well, Carl, are you – so in, when you got it on, are you using the absolute direction? Yeah. Yeah, I mean that that robot uses the absolute heading, which with the magnetometer off, who cares? Because yeah. it, it, it's whatever it thinks is initial when you power it up. I mean, it's yeah. all relative. Yeah, so I'm trying here. to figure out in my mind would would that make uh, a, I mean, for six well, it's fine, yeah. right? Because you just yeah. put it down there, you put it down there in the course, and uh, yeah, I it, mean. I usually don't have the magnetometer turned on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just always remember Eric's Eric's uh, circle of death where, you know, he's heading straight for the cone, he's heading straight for the cone, and then he hits where they removed a light post, and I guess they'd left the cage of, yeah. of rebarb in the ground, and it's all of a sudden his rope butt just keeps going around in a circle. Yeah, no, you're, you, you know, I should follow conventional wisdom, or I should be more careful and replicate the tests that I did. Like I would love to see, you know, we ought to see that sometime and when we get together. Maybe you can just show us. That would be cool. Because uh, I would, be, you know. Hmm. Well, I'd, I'd love to get it to where, because... Um, do you do any special or uh, calibration for your root robot? Or yeah, just, every every time I I change the body somehow, or I have or I swap out the mega because it fries. How that happen? No, 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 no. I mean, do I, you like wiggle it or something before I, you put well, it on the ground? Like I say, I every time I change the configuration, I do a calibration. I run a, a different version of the program that does a calibration and saves it in in double EEPROM on the mega. Oh, okay. And then every time it boots up, it starts. In most of the time, it boots up and it's fully. It's got a full sensor system fusion without anything. Yeah. But, um, I mean, then it tends to lose it with a little bit of driving around, which is another thing that lends, lends me to think that um, over short distances, when you're only moving in like one axis or one dimension, I'll bet that the, the um, auto calibration algorithms tend to fail in that thing. Yeah. Just because, I mean, it's the way it behaves. Mm -hmm. It's, it's calibrated when it come up, and after a little while, it, it's sitting still, it stays calibrated, but as soon as you start to move it around, it loses it. Mm. And then you have to, like, move it a lot before it comes back again. Mm. Yep. Yeah, I think um, I think Scott dropped off, but um, he's, he's basically using odometry and um, the LiDAR when... Uh, like he does a periodic check and lines himself up with the with the two walls with the lidar, so he knows exactly where he is. Yeah, and then he goes back to using odometry. So he's not, as far as I know, he's not using um, the BNO zero five five on his platform. He doesn't need to. No, yeah, because yeah. he's got good enough odometry, and he, um, every time he goes to the goal, when he get passes through the goal, you know, he he measures that thirty five or whatever it is, 32 to 35 
inches. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's where he makes uh, his calibration. He doesn't even run it during the rest of the time. I mean, it's yeah. Tiny. I thought he also did, and I don't know what triggers it, but it would like point itself at the wall near the goal, uh, the long wall, and mm. do something there. I don't know. I'm I'm assuming that's where he realigned it, or do you remember seeing that that it would do that sometimes? I think he played with it, but I don't know if he actually uses it. But oh, one of the, okay. yeah, I was thinking about, you know, uh, it, I was thinking about adding a, uh, two, two uh, sensors 45 degrees away from each other uh, so that when you're out on the field, whenever you get the reading, that says those two sensors are the same. You know you're perpendicular to the wall, and then you could you could shoot side sensors to see the distance. So I was thinking of going along something like that to do the same same impact. Doug, what kind of sensors would you use for those? Uh, uh, those Pololu distance sensors. Uh, I can't. Are the ones that? Are they infrared or? No, they're uh, time of flight. They're time okay. of flight, little time of flight ones. Uh, and they're, I really like them. I, I, I put them on a, a lot of my little robots that I've been playing around with. So, um, Mike, you, you could scan, rub this across the floor and see if you get any any anomaly it's like your your magnetic anomaly detector you know to see what happens with uh they yeah. kind of do it huh oh definitely yeah it'll definitely point it out so and you video it and run it through open cv to detect where north is yeah yeah <laughs> so yeah just point your camera at the compass and figure out what's going on haven't we seen somebody do that once before with the Captain Jack? Uh, yeah. uh, I think I think they talked about it. They never did anything. <laughs> it was me. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but it would, would have been fun. To, because, uh, because it's clear, you can shine the camera right through it, and then you can also see how the ground is moving below, so you can fuse yeah. that with the optical flow, and you're yeah, golden. Yeah. <laughs> now, does, that, does, that, does your camera read letters because if it does you could just put a sign on the north wall that says north <laughs> <laughs> yeah no you can't because you know you, you can't have anything back in that that you know Doug will come up and blow his whistle and no, 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 no. We all need to know the direction of places around the thing when we're inside that room. It's not specifically for you. If if you were allowed to have a green thing that we could we could fake out, why can't you have a big letter N? Yeah, oh, but I, I thought you couldn't have anything directly behind the either goal. Yeah, you can't. You can't. It's the okay, so outside. northeast. Just you know, northeast. Exactly. You'll you'll never get it past the rules committee. I'm telling you. H for home base. S for stay away. Just do yep. east and west, and you you can figure out where north and south are. <laughs> yeah, I was. You know, I, I'm sure this group would be be wise to it. But um, there's a little eight by eight thermal sensor, and um, you know, in in doing six can, you know, one of the things you do is you you stand at the end, wait for your robot to deliver cans so you can get them out of the way. Well, if you had that little thermal sensor and you're standing in the center of the goal, you know, it's it's going to find you. you know, <laughs> keep right on you. <laughs> There's no rule for that yet. I do for everybody else, too. Um, no, I guess there isn't. Uh, might have to hurry up and do another contest before there is a rule for that. <laughs> no, I would just think you'd be a beacon. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you, yeah, it would be a beacon, you know. So. Yeah, so, so that, then you were illegal. The rules cover you. Yeah. But I do think it's a good idea. Oh, yeah. 
I guess, you know, you start the robot off, you better have a, you know, the first cam better be a little slow. You got to get down to the other goal and line up. Otherwise, it's going to crash into the wall. Yeah. So. Our primary judge just said it's a good idea to cheat. No, no. Well, <laughs> it's recorded. You can go after You can go after it. <laughs> but. He just wants to debate. Yeah, well, you know, you know. When does the time start? When you say go, or when it moves out of the starting zone? When it start, when it starts to move. Okay, yeah. so you got plenty of time to, you know, put a couple seconds delay in it. Done. A little delayed start there. Yeah. yeah. What the heck? Yeah. Well, you know, a potential flaw is that you wouldn't even have to wear an orange shirt to attract that robot away from That's you. Right. Standing yeah, on we the just, if we just stand it, we would just sl- start at the end and sort of slowly walk back to the other goal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look at that, Ray! Look at it go! Yeah, yeah. Follow me, come here. You know. <laughs> yeah, we're good. Yeah, go out, go outside just before you know your particular contest starts, so you're nice and hot, you know, and the thermal imager can you know see you really well, and then you know. Yeah, hurry up. But yeah, it's not going to distinguish from other bodies, that's for sure. You know, so anybody else walking by the end of the goal, you know, mm-hmm. it quickly backfire. Yeah. So. Now what could go wrong? <laughs> you could combine it with facial recognition, though. That's true. Well, you got to yeah, be you got to be close be enough for it, though. I don't, they don't. I don't think they it's don't really work ten feet away. Yeah. They don't on a lot of those things. There are at least the ones like the flares. They uh, what the thermal part is pretty hard to recognize sometimes what it is. Mm-hmm. It's, but they impose kind of like an out uh, where they've extracted all the lines of the original video image. So they put them on top of each other, and that's why it looks like you got real good definition of the colors. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh well. Hey, I'm gonna have to drop off, guys. It's you guys are getting close to my bedtime. So right. I'll see ya. We'll see you, Doug. Okay. Um, see you guys. Is that a call for yeah. adjourn? I'm out to move ya. for adjourn. All right, guys. So have a good evening. We'll catch you next week. Too. Yeah. Wonderful evening. Bye bye. Hmm?